welcome. Uh, you are here at MOHAI and uh, at the Building with Purpose Black Architects and Community Agency Program. So thank you. Today we're going to be learning about changing neighborhoods, equitable development, and how you maintain neighborhoods in the face of this change. So while talking about land and displacement, it's incredibly important to acknowledge that here on MOHAI, we are on the historic and contemporary lands and waters of the Duwamish, Suquamish, Muckleshoot, and all Coast Salish people. Historically, Native communities were forcefully removed from the city, but today we honor their continued endurance with deep respect and gratitude for their unbroken stewardship of this place. We encourage you to visit the websites of local tribes to learn more about the people whose land you are on, and to learn more about uh, the contemporary as well as historic unbroken stewardship. So today, this program is part of a long partnership between MOHAI and the Black Heritage Society of Washington State, who I also encourage you to learn more about. In fact, there's a table back there with more information if you would like to go talk to some of the amazing BHS volunteers after the program. And as a reminder, uh, BHS members always get into MOHAI for free, so yet another incentive to become a member. So uh, MOHAI and DHS have been partners for a very, very long time and have enjoyed a deepened sense of relationship and part of what we get to do are programs together like this one. So Stephanie Johnson Tolliver is the president, the current president of BHS and a joy to work with on creating programs like these. Stephanie has, um, a, leads the dedicated board of directors and is committed to upholding the society's mission to preserve and share the history of black people from across the region. And I'm now going to turn it over to her to introduce the amazing speakers we have today. Thank you. Rachel, thank you so much for, for your kind words um, about me and the BHS. We have been institutional partners uh, with the Museum of History and Industry. And, um, I used to say 25 years, I think it's closer to 30 now, um, which is uh, an amazing journey. And um, I've always said they put a ring on it, right? <laughs> we are uh, forever their partners. and. Uh, this uh, conversation today um, with BHS is, uh, and MOHAI coincides with the exhibition uh, that I hope you've already had a chance to see or will see uh, following this program uh, of From the Ground Up, Black Architects and Designers. Um, before I, I, I keep going, I. I see some of our, our board members are here from the BHS, and I want to be able to acknowledge them because this is really a, a volunteer team effort at BHS. Uh, so Carol People Proctor, hello Carol. Woo! At the back of the sign-in uh, table and information Q and A, um, Susan Taylor, who is our secretary. Woo! is our treasure and also collections team. Um, we had another collections team member who really wanted to be here with us today, but you know, she's got that bug, right? So um, she could not be here. So again, we're really excited that this program coincides with From the Ground Up. Um, it was co-developed with BHS and Mohai and the curatorial assistant, Hassan Kirkland. I just can't say enough about Hassan Kirkland and um, what he's done to champion the effort between us and BHS. We've worked before with Hassan and Mohai on Stand Up Seattle, which was a really beautiful exhibition. Um, so he's back this time, and you'll see his handiwork um, in terms of how that um, exhibition moves and flows. And another shout out real quick is to 
of Taylor Brooks. Hi, Taylor. Library um, with Taylor put together a companion um, reading list, a book list for the exhibition. Um, they've done similar for um, an exhibition with the Green Book and then also at Sam for a recent exhibition there. So we really appreciate um, Seattle Public Library and the biggest shout out to Douglas True Branch. Yes. Um, 23rd and conversation is really timely right now because um, the state of Washington is conducting a survey of African American heritage sites mm -hmm. and uh, part of that um, charge is that they are looking at the sites and locations that black architects built you know and, and this is statewide and so we're seeing um, uh, some surprises I mean along the way and I hope that within the next year, um, there will at least be a partial list that's available for everyone to see. And what this is going to do, the survey, is going to inform architects and designers so that as they're designing in your neighborhoods and your communities, they're gonna see those significant places that they need to be paying attention to. You know, we're saying these are the places um, in our community that as you design, we want you to be considerate of that space. So I'm really excited to see how that survey develops. Um, and today, um, it is my joy as I, I sit with three women who I admire so much. Um, they lift me, and I don't have any problem saying out loud and proud. Um, we are of like minds, which makes it a little easier. <laughs> I think. Um, so um, our discussion today is around um, the built environments and the character of our neighborhoods um, as livable and accessible spaces. And so that's where um, the community agency piece comes into play, right? Where we're, we're asking you to, to be that agent in your community and watching um, for those sites as it's being developed and um, design. Um, and again, sadly, right, the elephant in the room, and we gotta say it, is that Lori Allison Wilson is not with us today on our panel. Um, Lori, that whatever that bug is that's out there right now, um, really caught her in the last couple days. She's very disappointed that she could not be here. I wish that she could. Um, she is a fabulous architect and one of those um, citizen architects, you know, someone who's in the community um, doing the work to encourage folks to, to be able to participate in, in what their community and neighborhoods look like. So sending Lori all these warm and healing vibes and I think you'll get a chance to see her and hear from her um, in uh, a series of uh, Program, public programs that will coincide with the exhibition. They're coming up um, the end of this month and then I think, I believe it's the first of April. So there'll be black architects sitting together and um, talking about their experiences and encouraging young people, right, to, to go on that path that um, young people can see themselves in the exhibition, but also in them. So uh, I hope that Lori will be available for that, I know. Um, we're anticipating and we know Rico Coronado and um, with the City of Seattle planning and community engagement, Don King um, and Allison Pride and all of these really fabulous architects you'll get an opportunity to, to hear from. So, Lori, wherever you are, laying in bed, yes. sipping tea, um, we're thinking of you. Uh, on the program, there are uh, the back side of it. And thank you, Rachel, and the Mohai team who put together our, our handout today, our program handout, um, are some short uh, bio statements from our team here. Um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna read that. I'll let you read it. I know you can read. So uh, I'm not gonna read that, but what I'd like to say is 
uh, just a personal something about each one of these women and, and why I say that I admire them so much. And they're appalling. You know, uh, we have not um, known each other for a long time, but it feels like a long time. I mean, in a good way, right? <laughs> <laughs> So, um, Baron is a fellow um, at, on the boards, an artist, an educator, a visionary, who makes me want to be that better person for recognizing the kind of the dynamics and the, that domino effect of our action or inaction, right, when it comes to equitable um, spaces and accessibility and um, also who is entitled or not. Mm -hmm. Cynthia Brothers, yay! <laughs> um, Cynthia and, and I too um, have been chatting and talking back and forth um, in person, but also social media where we're like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and she's this community advocate, right, um, across all city neighborhoods um, to shine light on the spaces that define us, vanishing, not vanishing, still standing, you know, thank goodness, um, and her passion for our sense of place, our place in it, and um, how all of this can influence the evolution um, of our neighborhoods and our communities, so thank you. And Jackie, <laughs> Jackie Peterson, um, a curatorial consultant, um, exhibitions consultant, uh, public historian, and creative, where we're like, mm -hmm. like this. So, you know, so I, I refer to her sometimes as my kindred spirit. Yes. Right. Um, she is a history keeper and seeker, which I love. It's like digging deep, going down the rabbit hole, yes. and then coming back with, with what you find there, right, and sharing it out. Um, that's what I, I absolutely love about Jackie, feeling like I'm always on the same page with her. Um, and I have to say, let's face it, Jackie, you know, um, we could be a pretty cheap date if somebody just said, let's go to the library. Yes. <laughs> 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 you know? All day? Yep. Yeah, you had to kick me out of the DHS archives that day because yeah. I couldn't stay there all, all evening. Right. Well, what about the Seattle Theater Group? Yes. That library. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So, um, so yes, we're here today, and um, I think we should just, you know, get started now that when, you know, I've been patting them on the floor, <laughs> and smiling at them and at you. So, um, let's get on with the business of hearing from them, um, us having a conversation that engages you uh, just a bit, and hopefully uh, we'll have a little bit of time for some Q and A at the end. But we'll stick around a little bit too after if there are any questions for us. Um, so, uh, dear audience, Jackie Peterson. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out today. Uh, Stephanie mentioned I join you as a storyteller for museums and a lifelong student of history and culture. And we wanted to start our, our program today with a short video uh, because we felt like it really set the tone f so perfectly for our conversation. Uh, this video was originally presented at a program that Stephanie and Verrett and I did uh, for the Seattle Architecture Foundation called Character Matters. And it was produced by the incredible folks at Converge Media, so shout out to them. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> media outlets I've laid eyes on in many, many of my years. Um, but this video really hi highlights three different spaces throughout the Central District. Uh, it gives you a really good sense of the landscape shift that we're all aware of that's, that's happening in front of us. And on this video, you'll hear the voices of Brett McCauley, who is uh, joining us today, and the architect, uh, Margaret Knight, who is a brilliant, brilliant community, community advocate. Uh, wonderful, wonderful person who's been really working very hard and very diligently on ensuring that the community is represented at the table uh, in a lot of these development and design projects. 
Uh, and so really their, their work is ensuring that the hopes and the wishes and the needs of our communities are not just heard, but are present, visibly present, and reflected and embodied in the development that, you, that, that we will see around us. What does it mean to have builders, contractors, architects, community organizers, folks from the cultural and property development authorities sitting in the same room having this conversation about how to center and foreground the communities that are immediately affected both by the threat of development, but also by the successful reclaimments of spaces, and to have them at the forefront, their testimonies at the forefront, for how we go forward and how the city continues to be developed. Design review is one process that we have in place in the city, which is meant to give a voice to residents in shaping the built environment of their neighborhoods. Whether you love it or you hate it, it's the one thing that we have to help ensure new development is designed in a way that thoughtfully integrates into its surrounding community and really takes into account feedback that's given by residents in the surrounding neighborhood. Seattle has eight different review boards. Central area is just one of those eight. Uh, it spans a big area. So that's why it was very important for the community to come together and really request that the central area receive its own design review board as well as some design guidelines that would be specific to that area and helping to shape how new development comes online. What would it look like to have a work that offers a reckoning to participating audiences who come to engage our immersive works to think about what it is to risk belonging, risk placement, risk security and safety and shelter, but also what it looks like when reclaimance works, what it looks like to identify ourselves on the spectrum of gentrification and to challenge people to think about gentrification that way, that it's not a black and white issue, it's not either or, that we're all mixed up in the complication of this colonial construct that has displaced many and continues to displace many, Back in 2015, a group of central area residents got together to formalize the process of putting together design guidelines. Um, they started by reaching out to the city to make sure that this desire was on their radar in, in order to make it a reality. So those folks from the central area represented a bunch of different active community groups to form the Central Area Design Guidelines Coalition. So after that initial desire was put in place, it took about a year for the city to get on board. And then our work as a design group with the Central Area Design Guidelines Coalition started in the fall of 2016. And we really worked closely with them to come up with an engagement plan where we could reach out to residents and try to get a good understanding of what were the things that they wanted included in that document that would help give them some semblance of agency to help shape the built environment of their neighborhood. Untitled is the name of the project because I am gesturing to the idea of titles, the idea of ownership. What does it mean to untitle the status quo of how we look at property and property ownership and who has a right to a space and how they can preserve their cultural histories? One thing that we knew we really wanted to do from the outset was to prioritize and center the Black and African American experience of the community and make sure that that voice was really felt strongly within the document and that any outside architects, designers, developers had this as a resource to understand like where are those community anchors? Where is the heart of the community and what are the aspects of design that really speak to that heart and help to create a built environment that feels very grounded in the community and acknowledges all the history and heritage that comes along with building in a place as steeped in history and heritage as the central area. Um, so you see how um, we've been discussing and talking on this topic for uh, a number of years and this beautiful uh, video that was created by Converge Media. Um, yeah, we, we had a really great conversation.
conversation last summer um, there you were in the room and Lori was actually with us yes. that time as well. So um, this is a continuation of that conversation and Cynthia has been doing such fabulous work, um, keeping us informed um, and I'd love to, to have her talk some uh, about um, the work that she does uh, at Vanishing yeah, thank you so much to Stephanie for asking me to be a part of this. Um, I've just been so excited and really grateful to be in conversation with you all today and to continue to learn from you. Um, yeah, so Vanishing Seattle uh, is a media project that I started in 2016. Um, and it's basically documenting the disappearing and displaced spaces in the city. Those might be homes, small businesses, other community gathering spaces. Um, but also, you know, trying to celebrate the places that have given the city its soul throughout the years. So this is just a snapshot of my website that's reflective of the Instagram. And it's uh, been expanding to additional platforms, um, including a short documentary series that took a deeper dive beyond the hashtag, looking at different community spaces and neighborhoods um, that were either being displaced or resisting gentrification <laughs> replacement. So for example, Wanwari in the Central District, Bush Garden in the CID. And some of the things that I'll just try to capture and document and share stories around are places that are <laughs> obviously vanishing or being pushed out. Um, this is the Red Apple and 23rd and Jackson that closed in uh, September 2017, I believe, and was redeveloped. I'll also share some um, historical kind of throwback, um, interesting history. Uh, this is the rocking chair, which was a jazz and blues venue in the 40s where Ray Charles played the very first night that he came to Seattle. And I'll also, you know, to try and counterbalance some of the, the more bummer content, um, do some not vanishings uh, to also, you know, show that there's places that people can support and invest their dollars back into community, especially BIPOC and women-owned, queer-owned businesses. Um, this is Central Cafe and Juice on 25th and Jackson um, with Bridget's uh, business, which, um, yeah, definitely encourage folks to patronize. Um, so for me, in addition to just documenting, the thing that I'm really interested in is the interplay between spaces and people, and not just the physical change of the landscape over time, but what are the social and the cultural um, changes that come along with that. So I'm just, yeah, I think this is a perfect <laughs> venue to have this conversation. Again, just really grateful to be to be a part of it. So we're gonna we'll let Cynthia um, dig a little deeper into this and in our conversation, but I'd love for Sarah to talk some about her project. And um, I know she, she always says, well, I'm not an architect, she is an architect. Yes. <laughs> she, yeah, you're, you're, build, you're building and designing. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, please. You're an architect of culture. Oh, there we go. Okay. I couldn't think That's of it. Yeah. <laughs> Cultural architect. Um, well, first of all, Stephanie, thank you so much for gathering us all here today and giving everybody their flowers in the room. It has been such a beautiful example of how to open it. And I'm so grateful to know you. Um, <laughs> I, um, so I'm, I'm an artist and curator, and I'm, I'm working on this project called Untitled, which is a, a site-specific, multi-locational um, performance and intervention. Um, of gentrified spaces and the geography of, of this project is specifically the CID and, and um, Central District. And it brings together a number of partners um, working as research, as research um, partners, as thought partners, also as sites that we're going to be doing these, a performance um, offering at the end of March. And Lori is actually one of the partners on the project who's been like teaching us about um, black architecture in the city and the histories of Central District. Um, and also Margaret, who you heard on the video, is one of the artists in the project as well who is designing historical mappings along with um, 3D renditions of contemporary mappings that show 
places that have been vanished or are not vanishing um, that will be part of the offerings of our performance. And we're working together. What I wanted to try and do was to see what it looked like or what kinds of conversations this kind of project could facilitate by putting different kinds of collaborators in the room together. So working with architects and working with the builders and thinking about how contractors work in the different neighborhoods, along with theater artists and visual artists and poets and musicians. And if we put everybody in the room to start thinking about what cultural memory means and what belonging is and who has a right to their lineage and their urban histories and how to preserve that culturally, then you know, it could facilitate a different kind of conversation and investment from community and stakeholders to help preserve our sites, right? So this is essentially um, what the project is seeking to do. Of course, we're working with Cynthia as well, who's been helping us to identify sites and bring relationships together. In fact, Cynthia is the one who introduced me to Stephanie. <laughs> Um, and so the sites that we'll be working on that will be um, in scape, which is the former INS building in um, the International District, and is now um, houses as artist studios. And we're working with Tara Tamaraguchi, who is one of the organizers behind Friends of Inscape, which is an organization trying to save this building that ironically is, um, is on the market, right, to be sold. Uh, and needless to say, the history of this building is incredibly important. It is a space where um, there was Japanese internment, where many immigrants came through to get processed into the United States. Um, and Wing Luke Museum has also created an installation that uh, lights these histories throughout the building. I highly recommend that you go there and visit it and get to know the histories of this building. Um, and also visit some of the artist studios. And a couple of the artists, including Tara Tamarabuchi, has personal family histories tied to this building. So it's been really important to build this relationship with her. Um, and that's her standing in one of the pictures there. She's taken many of us on tours through the building as we've been thinking through how to activate this building as an immersive theater space for the reckonings and performances that we'll be doing at the end of March. Um, the Sankofa Theater that is run by Tami uh, Wakoma, who is the daughter of Inye Wakoma, who is the land steward and one of the co-founders of Wanawari in Central District. She um, runs this theater space that's on the second floor in the Inscape building and will be one of the spaces that we'll be using for the performance. I just wanted to name her and give her her flowers here. Um, and Wanawari, which is in the Central District, the People's House, that is um, co-founded again by Inye Wakoma, Elizabeth Johnson, who you see at the top middle there, um, who is a curator for, for the house for community programs and art exhibitions, and um, Rachel Kessler and, um, and Jill Friedman, who does the oral histories for, um, for Wanawari. This is a bunch of us on the left, <laughs> is that your left or your right? Um, who are working together, the artists and, um, and community organizers working together to put this project together. And this house offers as a site, a space of reclaimance and joy and showing what resistance looks like when a space is saved and is preserved for cultural memory and cultural celebration um, and, and programs. And so, Having these two sites as the places that we activate in the project kind of gives the full story of what risk and what losses are um, on the, the one side of the gentrification story and then what on the other side, what the win looks like and who benefits, because everybody actually does, right? Um, and yeah, that's, that's as much as I'm going to share for now. <laughs> I, I left that slide in there. I just couldn't. Yeah, that's, I just, oh, that's, yes, even though she goes through everything. I didn't that, think we're going to She's just like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I actually want to say a word about Nori because please, Nori is. Please. I love how you said citizen architects because um, one of the things that we're doing in the project is uh, there, there are lots of different offerings, and one of them is an oral histories project that, um, <laughs> that we've been recording at Jack Straw. 
and shout out to Karen who was part of that. Um, and Lori uh, came in and um, did her recordings of that too because she's such a wealth of information of, um, of black architecture in the city. And in case you don't know, this is one of the first black woman architect, architects in the state of Washington. So just to know the history that she is holding, um, understanding the industry that she entered in as a black woman, right? Um, the kind of a resistance and work and pushing that she's had to do to represent black communities, working to develop low income housing for black communities, but also trying to educate people on African architecture, right? And what does that look like? What does black architecture actually look like? What are those st st style features? What are the functionalities of? She's trying to create that kind of education in Holly design space. And so I just wanted to, you know, I don't want to speak too much on her behalf, but just to say that, you know, that's that's the candle that she's holding in her profession and in her community work. Young, let's channel it. Yeah. I mean, she's like, just awesome, right? Um, and sometimes when, I know when I first met her, I thought, oh, she's so shy, right? And then when you get her talking, and she starts talking about her experiences, yes. you're just uh, drawn to her like a magnet. So. Um, thank you for saying those, those kind words about the Lord. Um, there's two things about what you said to Barrett. And one is uh, the Enscape building, right? Uh, if those walls could talk, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, the storytelling, and you see the storytelling in, uh, around all of our neighborhoods and communities. And so that takes you to what you're saying about the oral history piece with what you're doing too. And at DHS, we're really happy to be able to archive those those stories. So once they're very important, that's right. Yeah. Stephanie is archiving all the oral histories in this in our titles. Right, yeah. and, and um, you know, and with that piece, um, they're digitized. That means um, DHS is holding them in trust, and they're available for anyone to listen. You know, uh, we're working currently to upgrade our website to be able to accommodate uh, audio library and uh, video library. Um, we'll see that coming later in the year. Thank you for culture if you're in the room. Jill, yes, yes, yes. Uh, so excited about that to get uh, those oral histories off of uh, cassettes. <laughs> Before they break down, like in the late 1980s. So um, just, I know I'm, I'm going down my own little rabbit hole right now, but um, just to say that it's been really wonderful experience as we listen in collections to some of these these tapes. And um, you hear people like washing their dishes in the background. Um, you know, you want a cookie, honey? <laughs> Hello, we're in the middle of an interview. <laughs> so, uh, I absolutely love that piece about it. So we want to be able to preserve that and whatever you capture in the studio at Jack Straw, I love Jack Straw, but um, all the effort they do in the community. So we'll be preserving it, it should be. Um, so to place ourselves in community, what I, I wanted to ask you, Jackie, is that um, you always talk about being a transplant, <laughs> right? Yes. But still so connected. So when did you come to Seattle? So I think I might be the, the newest among us. Uh, I arrived in the summer of 2014, so about uh, now, <laughs> almost nine years ago. Does that work out? Yeah. Um, yeah, and, I, and I'm very conscious of my position as an outsider. Uh, you know, this is not my state. This is not my history. But at the same time, I'm very conscious of that shared experience, you know. Speaking of origin stories, Stephanie, you were one of the first people that I ever met, and you offered your hand to me when I was working with Nam on my, my inaugural project as an independent curator, and uh, it, it made me see Seattle in a way that I think a lot of other newcomers don't, um, and that was a very special experience, and it made me feel very welcome, and I'm always cognizant of trying to make that a reciprocal experience for other people that I meet, especially black people, because you know, Seattle has this reputation of being very cold and unfriendly, 
And I've certainly had my fair share of people who uh, make eye contact with me if I say hello or good morning. And um, I think that that feeling of, of welcome and that feeling of, you know, come on in, like you, this is your place too, um, is super important. And I'm always very conscious of that in, in my work and in my interactions with people. Um, so thank you for uh, embodying that value. Well, always. So in those nine years, going on 10, right? I mean, what have you observed in the, in the city? I mean, in just that <laughs> yeah. short amount of time. It's, it's as a, you move through the city and observe what, what's happening. Yeah, years. it's it's been a wild experience. And, and to give you some background, I lived in New York City for 10 years, and, and Brett will understand this as well, but you know, things happen fast in New York, but things happen even faster here. And you know, I've, I've lived in a variety of different places in New York City, um, and one of the things that I always at least felt somewhat okay about is that things were happening quickly, but at least some affordances were being made for low-income folks. You know, there were protections in place, you know, rent control, rent stabilization, and that does not exist here. And it still terrifies me to this day to watch things literally go up overnight. Clearly no input from any of the surrounding residents, in, unless in certain cases, uh, obviously there's very clear um, power power structures in place here that privilege certain voices over others, but I just, I'm blown away. And I recall a, a moment where I went to see the, the brilliant writer, Alice Walker, when she was in, in Seattle a few years ago. And she was talking about how she had really enjoys coming to Seattle, but on this most recent trip on her cab ride from the airport to downtown Seattle, she said, I looked around and I looked at these buildings and I thought to myself, the people who built these spaces do not love human beings. <laughs> and that still that comment still sticks in my mind and, and in my soul. And she's so right. Um, you know, you look around and you see these, you know, ticky tacky buildings that have no soul, that have no culture. And it makes me really sad. Um, but at the same time, you know, places like Wanawari and places like the Liberty Bank building give me so much hope because. This is this could be a really replicable vision and a model for how people can embrace and support the development in their neighborhood, but in a way that is about the people who are there. And I think so much of what strikes me about the development process here is that it's not interested in the people who are already here, or interested in bringing even bringing back the people who have been displaced, but. It's all about profit, it's all about bottom line. And I think that these two things are not mutually exclusive. You can have a profitable building, you can have nice spaces, you can have places that people are that people want. You know, people I think there's a fallacy that people don't like new things, that you know, we don't want new buildings in our neighborhood, that we don't want environmentally friendly spaces. That's completely false. What we want is those spaces to be welcoming to us. We want to feel like our culture is reflected in these spaces. We want to feel, feel like they were built for the things that we want and need and are culturally responsive. Uh, and so I think that seeing that kind of shift happen in the last couple of years gives me a lot of hope. But it's still really terrifying to kind of watch from the sidelines. Yeah, really good observation. And that Alice Walker uh, comment, that, that hurts. But yes, right? And for just a real quick show of hands from, from everybody in the audience, um, who's been a resident of Seattle for five years or less? Okay. Two. Okay. What about 10 to 20 years? Okay. Two. Okay. What about 10 to 20 years? <laughs> and any um, long term or long residents for more than 30 years, lifers. Yes! <laughs> I'll join that club. I love that. So you know what we're talking about with your community, right? And, and how you see it change and build around you. Um, I know I live in a community. Um, in the middle of the Central District, I will never leave. They can, you know, I'll be that that 
yeah. lady and whatever <laughs> that Disney movie was that you know with the house in the middle. <laughs> I'm not going. And um, anyone who knows me knows I live on one of the steepest hills in Seattle. I will be 90 years old with my walker and still trying to navigate that hill. <laughs> so um, I am embracing all of this uh, wonderfulness in, in the audience um, and hoping that you'll chime in just a little bit later with us too on the character of your communities. But um, one of the things that I, I want to ask you ladies too is about, um, is about the character and why that's so important. Why you, Jackie, you, you gave us a little bit of a feel on that, but, but why is it so important for us to um, be centered around that, that space in our communities and our neighborhoods and, and taking ownership of it? I feel like I, I, bet, between your question and everything that Jackie was just saying, <laughs> yes. and everything that Cynthia posts on Vanishing Seattle, <laughs> Um, to speak so directly to this, this the idea of character or, or sort of dissecting that a little more and going into what cultural memory does for your sense of identity and your, your knowledge of your existence in a place, right? I was talking to um, one person, Jasmine Scott, the other day, um, who's the ED of, um, of Art Noir, who just opened in the Central District um, in the Midtown Square. Um, and she, she's from Central District, grew up in Central District, uh, can tell you every block what was there when she was a child coming up, what she was used to seeing on the streets. Lori talked about this too in Central District, used to seeing families, used to seeing you know, the barbershop and hearing different stories and having things uh, reinforced, right? because of the speed at which everything has been built over, those families are gone, the traditions and rituals of each day of the week are gone, that she's saying she can't believe it, she can't really fully remember from block to block what used to be on a block because everything is gone. Mm -hmm. If one or two stores are gone, that's one thing, but you have a couple of anchors that tell you, oh yeah, this was like Aunt Annie's spot where we used to come and do our hair or whatever. When all of it is gone, you lose your bearings and then memory starts to slip. Heritage starts to slip, story starts to slip. And then what identity are you passing on to the next generation? How are you holding on to, to your cultural identity and your memory? And so when you're talking about like, I lived in New York for 17 years before moving here. Um, and and w watching that in multiple neighborhoods, just like Jackie's saying, like I lived and worked in multiple neighborhoods and watched that happen on the Lower East Side, and you know, Lower West Side, Upper East Side, you know, the Barrio, Brooklyn, right? It's literally, it's very, it's almost violent. Yeah. Because you have these memories in a particular building that you can't get that sensory feeling back because it's gone. Um, and so not having people participate in how these nice spaces are built so that character is added to the beauty, mm -hmm. then what's the point? That's how, yeah. how Alice Walker ends up with a line like that because if a place lacks character, then it doesn't look like it's built for humanity. Mm -hmm. It's just built for the accumulation of capital. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ah, boy. <laughs> Stuff that nightmares are made of <laughs> in some ways. Yeah. Um, but, you know, um, understanding that progress happens, we evolve, and um, how do we, we take charge of that and have a sense of that, um, everyone uh, in their communities, and um, the banishing part, um, and what you said too, Barrett, is uh, for me, those anchor places, when those start banishing, mm -hmm. I'm the person who goes, Turn left at the bar tails. Yes. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. yeah. Go, go two blocks. You know, there's a church on the corner. But when that's all gone, I'm like, where am I? You know, so, and I'm a born and raised Seattleite, and, and I need those anchors. So um, when we, we look at that in the context, um, Cynthia, how you pose to keep us, you know, engaged with what's happening there. Um, 
how do you see that sort of sense of, of character? And yeah, I mean this. All that you, you see. Yes, uh, I mean, I love this video, Character Matters, I think. I'm really interested in the different dimensions of character. Some people might interpret that as just what does a building look like aesthetically? Um, but for me, I mean, and I think what we're also talking about here is like cultural character, mm -hmm. or maybe the characters, like the interesting mm -hmm. people and yes. the weirdos and the folks that can feel like they have spaces and where they can belong and be welcome in the city. Um, and a lot of you know things that were brought up with um, you know the need for a community-driven design review board. Um, if I could bring in um, an another hat that I wore as a member of the Chinatown International District Coalition, the CID Coalition, AKA Humbao's Not Hotels. Um, that was an anti-displacement and cultural preservation group that was founded in 2017. Shout out to Auntie Karen, and Auntie Sue, <laughs> some badass elders organizers that are here representing <laughs> Sharon. Um, so the International District has a design review called the ISRD, International Special Review District. That was established in 1973 as a result of Asian American organizing to um, in a reaction to the encroachment of the kingdom to I-5 to over 100 years of bad and frankly racist urban planning that um, affected and displaced businesses, residences, people. Um, and that was intended to preserve and rehab low-income housing, to protect services for elders and families, to protect small businesses, and um, I feel like that fight is still ongoing. Um, we are, you know, the CID is still finding itself in a place where uh, speculative developers, hotel luxury developers, um, are seeing a big profit-making opportunity um, while the district is still one of the highest at risk for displacement. And so some of the things that the CID coalition has had to face are um, developers who want to tear down long-standing cultural institutions like Bush Garden and build developments that are clearly not for the community um, but targeted towards um, much higher income, hip professionals. And so the ISRD, although it has its limitations, it's not perfect, um, has been one of the few venues where um, we have been able to mobilize community members to come and speak out about the development, speak out about how they're not affordable, they're not family size. And I think it was glaringly obvious when the developers and the architects they've used are not in the interest of community. We've had things like um, the president of Coda Condos, um, which is a international Taiwanese developer, had not one local person from Seattle or from the international district um, on their team had not one Japanese American person, even though they claimed their development was going to be the new gateway and anchor for Nihonmachi. And so, you know, that results in things like the president of that company saying that Chinatown was old, dirty, and poor. Wow. Or thinking that um, a sculpture of a suitcase would be a good representation of Japanese American incarceration. <laughs> so, you know, these are just a couple examples of, you know, the things that manifest when you have um, a process where there's no community input um, or you know whoever's going to build there is not interested in character so i think it really speaks to the importance of having a mechanism oversight and really community control of these structures that are going to be impacting community and there is um, a group of folks in the community that are looking to how the ISRD process, the design review process, can be improved because it doesn't, you know, account for things like affordability. Like whenever we would bring that up, they would tell us basically, like, shut up, that's not, <laughs> that's not in the purview. Let's keep it, you know, let's keep it to like design materials and aesthetic. Like, stick a pagoda rooftop on it, and mm -hmm. it'll be all good. So, I think again, it's like community is everything, and that really should be where it begins and ends. And I'm like shaking my head, but nodding my head. Like, yeah, 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 right. no. um, and that's why uh, it's so important for for us, for all of us, 
to be at the table or in the room, right? And so um, we do have a process, and Cynthia, you mentioned it, and uh, Margaret Knight in the Character Matters video about the design review teams, right, and design review. And those were created to be able to help um, manage somewhat the development within our communities. Uh, I know with the, the Central District, um, you know, review team, um, there's been a lot of pushbacks um, as we're experiencing upzoning in our community. Not all communities in Seattle um, are experiencing upzoning, um, meaning you can, can build to whatever, um, and then um, a process where the developers can say, um, we're gonna have one community meeting, we're gonna invite you on a, on a Wednesday night at eight o'clock, you can come for an hour, tell us what you want, but then you don't really wanna, you know, we have an idea already of what we wanna do. So it is really important um, that if you have those design reviews and in your communities, is to be paying attention. When you get those flyers in the mail that say you have um, 60 days to respond to um, the condo or the, um, in, in my community, Walker Chapel, um, an old um, AME church um, has been purchased by a company that wants to bring 72 townhomes um, into this very already dense neighborhood. So um, those are the kinds of things you need to be paying attention to. Does anyone here um, know or, or have been engaged in the design review in their neighborhood? Yeah, just one hand. Yeah, I mean really, really pay attention to what's happening because you can help to influence that. I mean, sometimes it, it, it seems as though maybe you're not, but um, once you're on the record, and you can be the old squeaky wheel in the neighborhood, you know. Um, uh, my my fabulous neighbor uh, Ruby Holland, who I hope will come and next week, and she's going to come next week and do an interview and the sign in her yard that says, "Don't ask me, I'm not selling my home." <laughs> don't, don't knock on my door. Don't call me. You know, I, I absolutely love Ruby Holland. Um, so if you ever hear of a space where she's going to be and be talking about community and community excellence and, and how we can help to shape it, please show up for her. She's just, uh, you know, I absolutely love it. So um, we, we did touch a little bit too on the whole um, citizen architect business. And there is actually an informal um, recognition at AIA, which is the Association or American Institute of Architects, that they give this informal um, recognition um, that is for the members who are advancing community engagement um, and lead with the notion for improving living environments. And then it's all about participatory uh, planning and design, <coughs> right? And so those are the things that we want to um, challenge the developers and, and architects on, is the participatory part of um, engaging us in, in what is built around us. Um, you know, when architects design with this purpose, um, and as it relates to what you're doing, to bear it with untitled, I mean, do you see that? connection you see where um, you know you can help to push with this expression that you're bringing um, that there might be something that there is can catch well lean into really what this project is I see it as a facilitation and that's how I've prompted all the artists who've been commissioned for mm -hmm. the project is to say like we're not creating a work that is to be visually enjoyed or as an entertainment. It is, we need to constantly be reviewing ourselves to strip the vanities of an art making venture to just look at this as a facilitation of relationship. So that is how um, I would answer that is all of the different components of the project are to facilitate people getting information about design review boards, about all of the, um, the organ organizers who are actively working in Seattle to center communities and um, how they're developed. 
in how we're bringing different kinds of people who usually are contentious sides of this um, conversation to say, look, we want to get past the inertia of guilt or defensiveness and sit and have more creative, productive conversations about how to bring more community folks into the room. So it's kind of all of these things that create a reckoning, which is why we ask that question, where are you on the spectrum of gentrification? Because everybody's on it. We may not individually have created this, um, this, this system. Some of us are on the oppressed side of the system, and so obviously didn't create that. However, we are all complicit in it on one way or another, right? There are, there are artists, I, I, I actually put this challenge to people who, um, who were being commissioned into the project to consider yourself if you're an artist and you moved into a neighborhood that was affordable, that you know you displaced somebody else before you. Mm -hmm. Artists are never thought of in the spectrum of gentrification because they are usually the ones who have the voices finally to say, our neighborhood is being taken over and they can make art and make it visual and make it accessible in the way that queer communities or trans communities or immigrant communities, indigenous communities, couldn't make it accessible. So they're not called gentrifiers. But in a way, you're on the spectrum still, because there were people there before. And so it's that, how do we invite people into the conversation that way so that it becomes more productive because you're not defensive or you're not paralyzed by guilt? Because these two things are useless, right? So this is, this is kind of really the hope or how or the rubric I'm using for how can the project succeed is if after you come to the, the we have six um, offerings that we're doing between March 22nd and, and um, 26th at Inkscape and Guanawari, but we also have um, our maps that we're going to be distributing. We also have the oral histories that will be um, accessible through Black Heritage Society. Um, we have a guidebook that would be listing all, all of the resources that um, that we're all learning about from you all and Lori and Margaret, two black women architects, um, that if the relationships are fostered, then the success of the project actually happens after the project is done. Right. And, and the artists may not see it immediately. Mm -hmm. It may be a slow burn, but the slow burn happens through those relationships. Mm -hmm. I love the slow burn. Yeah. 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 I love that, and um, Jackie, I know as, um, as historians, and um, and then the rest of us here, you know, here too, so um, when we look at um, our communities and um, the history that's embedded there, um, the sites, the people, the stories, um, but we don't want to be stuck there. We're not stuck there, and we need people to know, right, that we're not stuck there, and that um, what is there or what has vanished from there uh, was to inform what we do now and in the future. Mm -hmm. So, what do you what do you think about all of that and um, being stuck in history? <laughs> uh, I think, if anything, um, I am personally very much someone who believes in what are the lessons that history teaches us and understanding those lessons to help us envision what a future might look like. It's just, it's a starting place, not an ending place. And I think what's really beautiful, particularly about the work you're doing, um, Farah, and also Cynthia, is that you are getting at those stories and those lessons. And I think the, the relationship piece too is one that we don't talk about enough. Um, and understanding those historic relationships really lends value to how we understand how to work together now. And I think if we don't acknowledge some of those historical relationships, good or bad, uh, if we don't understand that historical context about what a community anchor really is, um, just that, that idea of just being completely disoriented in your own, on your own home, um, we are not gonna have productive conversations about what, what our next step looks like. And so for me, the value is, is really in the context. And I think we all have context. You, know, you said that beautifully, Brett, that um, you know, we all have a backstory, we all have a context, we all show up in a community with a backstory. And I think that we need to give ourselves the space to understand our contexts 
uh, and then how those contexts are going to kind of interweave together um, because it's really the, the summation of that and that vision. You know, how do we how do we leverage that to build a vision, right? Because we have to start thinking not about tomorrow, but about five years from now, about ten years from now. And like you said, Stephanie, you know, we may not see the fruits of that labor in that time, but the work is still valuable. The work is still important. Um, I don't know if I, I'm gonna throw this out there and to you folks too. Has anybody um, gone out and give input to the city's comp plan? That's the future. No. Yeah. Okay. There's, there's a, there's a, a couple hands. Yeah. yeah. Well, that too is is very important. I know there's been a series of conversations out of um, uh, with Rico Corandango's office and community planning, um, where they've gone out and asked for feedback in community. But if we're not giving the feedback, then you know that train is sort of already left the station. But maybe you can kind of like put the brake on just a little bit in, in your neighborhood or your community. So pay attention to the comp plan, to the city's comp plan, and how that's going to affect you today and then 10 years and 20 years from now, 30 years when, um, let's see, I don't think I'll be here, but 30, 40 years out, um, you know, what is that going to look like, you know, for our ancestors and our descendants? So, so be paying attention, you know, to that. Um, I also was really curious about um, some of the sticky notes that people put on the board over there. Um, I, I think we were asking about places that were vanishing or um, have left. Yeah, um, Rachel, what do you? Since I'm over here, I can read some of them. Yeah, yeah. At least. Okay, so what is vanishing in your neighborhood? Uh, we have somebody said affordable housing, brick buildings, a uh, good home, uh, vanishing cool old buildings replaced by new condos. Um, and would you like to hear what design changes people yes. want yeah. uh, to make neighborhoods more livable in the future? All right, we've got better public transportation, clean yes. buildings, um, middle income housing, mm -hmm. more sidewalks. Yes, thank you. Yes. Yeah, yes. as someone who is more of a pedestrian oh doesn't God. drive, I, I feel that one. Oh my God. Uh, smaller use of fossil fuels, more wildlife friendly, more plant uh, life land, and more animal homes. Yes. <laughs> Which, uh, judging by the handwriting, we have a lot of school groups coming through. I think that was one of our students <laughs> who came through that one. Okay, so I, I love all that and I'm identifying with all of that. The sidewalks, mm -hmm. oh, um, yes. uh, the other thing that gets to me, and I don't know about the rest of you, but is how um, our neighborhoods are being designed as these really tall corridors, mm -hmm. right? So you're, um, the light that you used to have. Oh, when you walk, I mean, yeah. where's the light? Um, you know, where's uh, the movement? Where's the air? Where, you know, it's um, it feels uh, just not right and uh, conducive. Yes. So um, again, if if we're not um, participating in um, discussion on our community, um, it's going to continue to happen. We're not gonna have trees. We're not gonna have places yeah. for animals. Um, I can't remember the last time I saw a robin. Has anybody seen a robin oh, in their neighborhood? I mean, you, 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 you <laughs> saw a robin? <laughs> robin redbreast? I mean, I, when I was a kid, I used to see them everywhere. You know, the birds, um, the blue jays. And, um, you just, you, know, you just I, bring up something that, that makes me wanna say, I mean, this is not directly attached to what we're talking about today, but it's intrinsically um, related anyway. Is I, when I look at all the glass buildings growing up, um, yeah. coming, you know, form, having formerly lived in a concrete jungle, right? Yes. <laughs> um, where I can tell you a lot of animals do not thrive except the pigeon and the rat. Yeah. Um, you know, that is 
that is something I almost feel compelled to say as, a, as an ex-New Yorker, New Yorker. Don't let it happen yeah. to your beautiful yeah. <laughs> environment. Because one, I'm thinking about the environment and all the sand and the sand mining that it takes to make all that glass that goes into those yep. buildings. So this is an environmental issue of the first order, yeah. right? Um, but also, right, how it, it removes life. Mm -hmm. Like the birds you're talking about, but all the creatures, the insects, the ones that annoy you or gross you out, but still they have a right to be living on the planet. Yeah. <laughs> and they're not going to want to live in concrete because there's nothing to eat. It's right. harder to grow things there. I don't know, the displacement of all of that. And um, it's really interesting that to be in a neighborhood that has green spaces that used to have exactly. um, wooded areas, mm -hmm. that yes. now we, we're not seeing those green spaces and wooded areas anymore. I looked out my window, and I said this, I don't know if I told you guys before, mm -hmm. I looked out my bedroom window one day and said, oh God, look at that cute squirrel. It was a tree rat. It was not a squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, went, I zeroed in on it, I, you know, the glass was shifting, and I was like, oh no. <laughs> so the more, it's true. Yeah. 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 Everything has its particular evolution, you know? Yes. And yeah. so it's like, what do we want to evolve? <laughs> exactly. You know? There's, also, there's a great um, account on social media or a group called The Last 6,000 that I would encourage folks to check out. They work on issues of urban tree canopy, mm -hmm. which um, has been declining, yes. <laughs> um, along with a lot of the development, to no surprise, over the past few decades. And there's also a lot of loopholes around um, the removal of trees, and sometimes developers will pay a fee and take a tree out anyway, or just go ahead and chop something mm -hmm. down that's supposed to be protected and retained. Um, so yeah, they're doing a lot of great advocacy work and also involving a lot of um, residents to uh, catalog you know, the trees that are in their neighborhoods and advocating for better tree protection. So the last 6,000, yeah, check them out. I guess I do have to hand it to the city and um, to the folks who are interested in our canopies. And as uh, our trees are coming down, particularly our street trees, I would encourage everyone to go, you can go online and see which trees in your neighborhood that the city owns. And, and uh, you know, maybe they're, they're not the trees that maybe you planted on the parking strip, but there are trees there that they maintain. And when those trees go down, you can say to them, I want my tree replaced, you know? And they actually are pretty responsive. They will um, send you a list of tree replacements that they have in stock, and you can decide, and they'll deliver them to your parking strip. You have to plant them now, but you know at least you know, and they will blind the old stumps. I'm putting it out there that they will blind the old stumps on a fallen tree. If there's a hazard tree, they'll come and take it down and um, give you a replacement. So think about that in terms of canopy when you. You see something go away, um, ask questions about um, what you can do to get that replaced in, in your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, I really want to be able to um, talk to you just a little bit about Yolanda Barton, too. Um, and you'll see that there's a, a short bio statement of Yolanda that's on the reverse of your program, too. Um, Yolanda is. Um, was born and raised here in Seattle, um, has gone on to really great things um, with her vision and, and VR and immersive experiences and um, talks a lot about storytelling, the sort of things that we're talking about today in community and, and what's vanishing and what we can protect and, and that our stories um, really help to define um, and inform us. Uh, she is currently living in Atlanta, but moves back and forth between Atlanta and Seattle. Uh, she recently has been working on a VR experience uh, that is a tour of Seattle Central District. Um, they created kind of a little crazy avatar of me. <laughs> like, you know, you know I, I, I wanna you know, work with the hair. <laughs> um, but uh, it's gonna be a lot of fun when it's complete and it's in. It's very factual and informative. So I want you to watch out for her. And she did record a piece for us. I'm gonna to try to 
she did report a piece for us. Um, there she is, there's that Yolanda. Um, so let's hear what Yolanda has to say about um, VR and as a tool You know, the technique is like, I didn't know that it was just going forward. Okay, let me try something else. Sorry about that. It's okay. You just have one clicker. Right. And my mom's house, she's got three. I'm like, what's up? Sorry. You know there's a, a VR experience, immersive experience in the atrium. Has anyone taken that experience? Okay, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it once we do it. She is doing some exciting things. We'll be back in Seattle soon. Um, I hope that we'll see um, some of the work that she wants to do in Seattle Public Schools. She's identified three high schools um, here in Seattle that she would like to work with, um, creating um, experiences, but also giving them skills. Um, she works with Oculus, so um, there are headsets involved and um, that she'll be bringing and sharing. So um, let's uh, hopefully we'll be able to hear. It's just a really short piece, but. Um, she has such a dynamic voice. Mm -hmm. I'll be able to hear from her. My name is Yolanda Barton, and I am the CEO and founder of Revere XR. I grew up in Seattle helping my grandmother pick which wigs and putting on her fur coat and pearls to go see live music in the Central District. And from their stories, I learned of the most amazing music legacies that shaped music and sound all over the world. We're talking Quincy Jones, Ernest Lee Anderson, Ruby Bishop, Ray Charles, Jimi Hendrix, Kurt Cobain, and way too many others to even name. Yet today, 15 minutes from where you're sitting, a lot of that history is no longer available. It's vanished and been erased. We continue to pave over geographic spaces that house profound memories of our history, our art, and our culture. Just because they're being erased doesn't mean they have to be forgotten. I'm an immersive storyteller, utilizing what we refer to at Revere XR as XR preservation. XR preservation has the power to introduce, reintroduce, inspire, educate, entertain, and heal those that have been disconnected from their history and stories. We recreate history cultural heritage, music, and memories in an immersive environment using augmented and virtual reality to bring that history to life. Yeah, this is cool. <laughs> XR Preservation also has the power to unify us in virtual worlds by capturing, uplifting, and amplifying the stories, the legacies, and the communities that are at risk of being erased. In our immersive experience, you can be teleported to a moment in time where Ray Charles and a 15-year-old Quincy Jones play at the same piano. You can be front row at a holographic VR Jimi Hendrix performance. I mean, the possibilities are endless. Together, we have the power to transform and recreate memories and spaces that are vanishing in the real world and recreate them in digital and virtual worlds. So our contributions, our legacies, and our stories are accessible, attainable, and fun for all to enjoy. We're asking for your support. So visit us at revereXR.com and follow us at revere.xr on Instagram. 
and join our journey to recreate history by using futuristic technology to preserve the past for the future. Thank you. about her as she uh, comes back to Seattle and, and engages with this community. So it won't be just the Central District, but it'll be um, citywide. So look for her and the whole virtual experience that I'm talking about in the atrium was created by uh, a company here, local company, Novabee. I get that right? Yes, I know. I'm just no. <laughs> At first I was going to go nobly. I'm like, that's not right. It's nobly. Yes. Yeah. Beautiful experience. Thank you so much. Um, what it does is, um, first I should say that in the exhibition, From the Ground Up, um, there is um, a bit of a story and share a 3D model, too, of the um, Samuel E. Kelly um, Ethnic Cultural Center at the University of Washington. That building was originally designed by Benjamin Napoli Jr. and then later upgraded and updated by a black architect by the name of Samuel Cameron. So um, the extension of that exhibit to the atrium is where um, with your smartphone, um, you get the building uh, built from the ground up. I love that relationship of, to the exhibition where um, you see the building come up in front of you and you have the ability to walk around it, am I right? That's cool. That's, yeah. yeah. So I hope that everyone will um, be able to experience that today and if not today, come back and do it again. But you do need your smartphone, am I right? Please tell us more about that, would you? Yeah, so it, um, this is augmented reality, which uses your own mobile yeah. phone, your smartphone. Oh, sorry. Uh, it uses augmented reality versus virtual reality, which we just saw there. Um, not quite as intuitive as VR, because it basically inserts digital objects into your real world surroundings that you can then view and interact with using your own mobile phone. So there's a QR code out there, and you can activate that and see what um, Stephanie has. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, shout out to to Samuel and um, Sam Cameron. Um, part of this, this journey for me um, in getting ready for today, but also um, co-developing with Lohai on the exhibition is the stories and the storytelling. And um, what I've heard from Ben McAdoo's daughter, um, um, oh, I was gonna say Eunice, um, Enid, sorry. Um, and how she shares the history of her mother and her father. Um, Sam Cameron talking to me about the design of the Ethnic Culture Center. Um, Leon Bridges, amazing black architect, early pioneer trailblazing architect, um, has got to be now 90 something years old and is living back east, but is sharp as a tack. And um, he was instrumental in um, designing the YMCA that is on 23rd and Olive in the Central District. Mm -hmm. And um, interestingly enough, um, as he designed that building, a portion of the old Y went to um, 28th and Dearborn to Walker Chapel. You see in this image, a portion of that building with the, the windows overhead was moved from that location to this location. <laughs> And now we see this is a, a place that is being developed. And for me, which um, this photograph, Cynthia, thank you for this photograph, um, is where we see the sign, uh, the project sign um, is tacked, is hammered to the front of the church reader board. And then someone in the community came along and said, rest in peace. And there's something about that, you know, that says to me, um, I'm, I'm paying attention to what's going on in my neighborhood, 
I don't necessarily like it. I don't like that you, you put this development sign on the reader board. Why didn't you put it over here to the side? Respect me and my community mm -hmm. as you bring this huge development into this space that was so integral um, in my community. They were service providers here. Um, that's a whole other story around our churches, um, not only black churches, but I'm sure other communities are experiencing where their churches to the, um, you know, uh, they're declining just a bit. So we, we do plan to do something around black churches, don't we, Carol? Yes. Yes. Like really so yeah, this year. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, stay tuned for that. Um, I wanna, as we get close here to the end for us, um, there's a couple things that I wanted to, to mention. I want everybody to get a chance to say something before we move to a, a Q and A. Um, yeah, I, I did want to add something. Um, I don't know if we can't like use the clicker anymore, right? Um, back to Lori Wilson for a moment um, to say just if you want to learn more about um, the work that she's doing since she wasn't here to speak for herself, um, there is a, a list. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and this image is actually from the article that I'm about to cite. There's a, um, an article about her in Crosscut as part of the Black Heart Legacies series of, um, of articles that are about black artists all, all over um, Washington, all over Seattle. Um, and she's included as, as one of the first black women architects in Washington, right? Um, and I highly recommend reading that article. It's written by Kami Adiemi, um, who is one of, the, um, one of the creators of the Black Arts Legacies, along with Jasmine Lamoon. And um, they did a fantastic job on, on covering her Lori's story from you know, how she started in architecture, all of the different projects that she's been a part of, and her activism and community. Um, and you know, sort of the aesthetics that she's driven by and the African um, structural histories that she, she references in her work. So I um, just wanted to put shout that out. And then also, if you wanna follow along with the development of um, the Untitled Project, there are a couple of sheets up front with a QR code that you can scan and follow um, on Instagram. It is a new Instagram um, account, so there's a, only a couple of posts up, but there's going to be a lot of archiving um, that's going to be up there. This project is going on through um, 2025 when it gets reset again um, in New York with different communities building it up again. Um, but the show is up from the 22nd to the 26th here in Seattle, and tickets will be available through on the boards. And then it's just four days, I'm just like, ooh, gotta, get, gotta get on that bus. <laughs> Right? Yeah, very much on that bus. <laughs> yeah, very much on the bus. Um, and um, I don't know, Cynthia or Jackie, any, any words before we move to uh, uh, Q&A? Um, yeah, I mean, just quickly, um, you referenced the Seattle Comprehensive Plan, and maybe another thing for folks to keep an eye on is that there is a state bill, House Bill 1026, that's under consideration right now to eliminate all design review statewide, possibly. Um, so I'm not like a policy expert, but I think, yeah, that would just be one to you know stay attuned to, because obviously that has a lot of impacts on just the ability of the public to have some engagement and oversight in developments in their neighborhood. Um, and then the other thing I would just something I'd share with you all is that so much of what I post is really informed by um, a collective effort. People send me pictures and information and stories, and there's so many times when I might do a post about a space that's due for demolition, and I'll be doing some research trying to find out what I can about it online. Might look at a historical report. And often it says that there was no one or nothing of significance associated with that space. One example is a house in the Central District, which turned out to be the Frank Jenkins house. And there's folks like, like Miss Stephanie, or maybe a resident or a neighbor, who was like, wait a minute, that's the longtime home of Frank Jenkins, who was an extremely influential black and Filipino organizer, who was a longshoreman, a labor activist, fought for racial justice um, on the waterfronts. 
of course this is a significant <laughs> space. Like, how could it not be? Um, so I think that really speaks to the power and the importance of us sharing our stories because it's not, a lot of times, not going to be any official records. Yeah. And there's, I think it's really imperative because that influences, like, who gets to determine what is significant and what's not? Who has the power to decide what vanishes and what's too important? to let vanish. Um, so I just, you know, I really want to thank everyone who is sharing their stories and paying attention to this, Black Heritage Society, Miss Stephanie, Barrett, Jackie, Lori, because um, I mean, I think that's really, we, that we need to speak on that because that's what's going to influence what progress can actually look like and who gets to benefit from that and who gets, to, who gets left out because there's power yes. in space. Uh, to impact your life. So yes. please keep sharing these stories. And I think the amount of time that you've been here in Seattle is really less important than just your interest in the city and its, and its people and our stories. So yeah, thank you for, for having me. Yeah, I would, to piggyback on that, I would absolutely encourage you really get out in the streets and look around and see what's in your neighborhood. Get to know your neighbors. Get to know the people in your community because that's really what's going to give you an appreciation and that context that I was talking about before. Um, don't don't be shy. Don't feel like it's weird or awkward because the city will have you believing that that's not how things are supposed to go. That's not how we're supposed to relate to each other. But that is couldn't be further from the truth. Um, and just a quick plug for a project that Stephanie and I worked on with the Washington Trust for Historic Preservation. I put my preservationist hat on for a second. Um, but there is a really beautiful tour of the Central District and some of these anchor places and some of these amazing, extraordinary spaces that still exist. Uh, it is not necessarily intended as a walking tour, but it is walkable. Um, but it's a really cool tour that I had the privilege to work on that really highlights, uh, we partnered with Shelf Life Stories so you'll get some of that oral, amazing oral history content. Um, but I encourage you to just get out and, and see what's around you and see what's changing and start to understand what people value and what people care about. And then just don't be afraid to, to speak about it. Don't be afraid to um, show up at those community meetings. Don't be afraid to show up at those design review meetings because you're just as important as the people who have been here for generations. And I think that, that fostering those relationships is really what's going to help get us to that, to that next level. This is all good. <laughs> this is all real good, and I really appreciate um, everyone for, for sitting with us and um, giving us a little bit of uh, feedback, talk back. Um, I, Rachel, we have just like, if there are any questions, uh, we're happy to, to answer. Rachel, that's the Rachel mic. Has the mic. <laughs> just, just raise your hand. We'll come around with mics so that everyone can hear your question. We love, we love questions. Hi, everybody. I'm, um, I think you're good. It's on. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. There you go. Hi. Hi. My name is Marilyn Whitewater. Um, I've been thinking of a particular spot in the Central District that would redevelop, and that's the site on 23rd and Jackson of the old um, Red Apple Market. And um, the, the building designers have obviously thought about making this an important community space. There's art incorporated in the plaza, really interesting, cool art by a local artist. Uh, but the functionality of the Red Apple Market has been completely displaced by this Amazon, uh, Amazon Go store. It's still, a place where you can get groceries, but it doesn't it doesn't carry the function that was displaced. And I just wondered if you had thought about that, that the character is embodied in what happens in the place, not so much in what it looks like. Right, you're right. I mean, it's all in the right? Yeah, definitely missing the red apple and shopping with my car to the latest R&B. Yeah. Um, so, 
Yes. So, so yes, that that's a huge um, issue within the, that particular community. Um, shopping, um, accessible accessibility. Um, you know, for folks who who live within the four to five block radiuses of that um, store, now are commuting. You know, by bus to to get groceries. And so. Uh, that was a long conversation about that that particular space, and I think the developers um, at Open um, listened to some, and then the rest of it just really didn't much matter. So again, um, with community and character matters showing up and uh, just being really loud in the room about what matters to you and what shapes your community. I'm just wondering, because I'm not originally from Seattle, and um, and I've never gone into the Amazon store. Um, I've been here for, been in, in, in Washington for like six years. You're not missing anything. Yeah. <laughs> but and I know I'm not missing anything, and I personally refuse to go into the store, because I, I don't have any interest in supporting that business. But, um, but what I'm wondering about historically, um, for the Apple store that was there before, like, I'm thinking in terms of other spaces that I've been in, understanding what a place is in a cultural functional way, which is what I think you're getting at. Um, that yeah, you go to buy your groceries, but yes, you're also living within the area and you can access it to speak to the accessibility, yes. but also you bump into people there, that you're interacting with people, and so relationship happens there. Relationship gets, you know, can, can, like be nurtured in, in these spaces that doesn't happen in the Amazon store. Do, do they have cashiers in that store? No. Like isn't that like some very weird, yeah. like 1984, 2054 yes. yes. kind of yes. futuristic vibe? Minimize all human interaction. Right, like don't, don't <laughs> interact. It's kind of like when they came up with this idea in New York to replace the, um, the bodega, which New York City yes. has on most corners. These um, like deli shops and um, called bodegas, and the cultural functionality of that is get bad coffee, communicate mm -hmm. with your, you know, mm -hmm. like check in with your yep. neighbors, yep. see each other, and you know the storekeeper. Yes. Like that person keeps that block safe because they know who you are, right? Mm -hmm. And they, there were like a couple of, of developers who wanted to set up apartment buildings where they replaced the bodega space okay. with a vending machines that have the same like junky snacks that you can buy in bodegas. Uh -huh. yeah. Help. <laughs> 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 Saying, talk to people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, hi. Well, thank you all for just sharing your uh, perspective, opinions, and your projects that are coming on. Chieko, um, I wanted uh, not so much a question, but just to build on um, Cynthia's plug around um, House Bill 1026. Um, that bill is actually. Um, lined up for a second reading. Um, it's like an active hot um, bill on the Washington State Legislature uh, Committee floor right now. So um, I think some things that you all really drove home today were um, one, that design review processes are really important um, and they are so important for keeping um, character in our community. Um, and the second is that um, for us all to think actively about what we can do to protect um, and preserve our communities. So if anyone was um, has been really inspired by the conversation today, um, I would really encourage you to um, even just do a Google search for House Bill um, 1026. Um, there are different ways that you can um, learn about this bill and um, advocate against this bill. You can email your legislator. You can just learn more. Um, I'm sure I don't know if you all have any other ways to get involved, but um, it is just it's really it's hot right now. There's opportunity to give feedback. You can actually give public comment um, at committee meetings. Um, it's all via Zoom, so uh, it's you know you know really quick. I think you have two minutes to give public comment. Um, so there are ways that you can um, speak up against this um, this bill, which would. Um, remove the requirement for community design review processes specifically for housing developments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to um, build on that. So having been
been through the design review process um, on the resident side for our block, uh, do not underestimate the value of bombarding them with emails because that becomes a really nice record. So I think we kind of think of that as maybe old fashioned at this point, but it, it is probably the most effective way um, quantity matters. <laughs> I will add quickly that um, I would also uh, challenge folks to think maybe even beyond design review and think more like visionary because again, as I alluded to with the ISRD process, it does have a lot of limitations, which I think <laughs> folks in the room who are organizing around that can speak to. Um, doesn't you know include aspects of equity, affordability. You can't tell them to include family size housing or social services. So when we held community visioning sessions, these are all the things that folks in the community were saying were needed. And then told repeatedly over and over again, sorry, that's not in the purview. So I think if we're looking to more medium long term, you know, sorry, not just with what the existing system is telling us is possible, but what do we need and create that into being and manifest that. I mean, that takes a lot of I think organizing and time and policy advocacy, but I think if you know we're not getting at those underlying things about affordability and you know accommodating for what we need to stay in our neighborhoods, then you know a lot of times it does kind of fall back on just like the aesthetics um, of what you know character embodies, which as we all know is much more than that. Um, so I haven't been to the tour yet, so I might get some answers there, but I'm just curious with regards to what developments have occurred that, have, that you feel are really successful in the community or Seattle, if you have any opinions or recommendations, and I'll definitely look at that walking tour. But, um. <laughs> and if you have none, that's cool too. I mean, there's not, there's, there are some really wonderful things and I have to say, particularly about the Central District, though, um, you know, there's a, a, a lot of sentiment and emotion around the changes and the development there, um, realizing <coughs> that the train has left the station. So what can we do to help uh, move it in a, a direction um, that is livable and um, potentially affordable? for everyone to, to be able to be. And so, and what you see happening at the corner of 23rd and Union. Mm -hmm. I mean, I am so inspired by that and the businesses and bringing uh, black owned business back yeah. to the Central District. When the Central District, uh, a traditionally uh, African American community um, from the turn of the century to the 1940s when it became a really burgeoning black community. Um, where their business, uh, you know, they thrived there. Um, then we see the transitions into the 70s and 80s and um, a lot of history around why that happened, redlining and a lot, lots of other things. But um, to now see how uh, building back, and you hear about building back through organizations like the African Family Land Trust. The Trust, yeah. The Trust. And, um, and their relationship with Bird Bar Place and uh, coming together in community to create spaces that um, are inviting community in, but are also lifting uh, black business owners, um, creating affordable living spaces, the Liberty Bank building um, that then um, below houses communion, which is a fabulous restaurant with Earl's Cuts and you know, and but also creating houses and and creating space also for um, for other cultural um, um, voices to be heard and seen. Right? Okay. Which is a, I sat on, on on a couple of juries for um, portable uh, portable artworks to be put in all of these developments. Mm -hmm. Right. So when you go to this corner, when you go to Twenty Third and you see all of the murals, but also inside of um, Africa Town development, there's going to be a lot of um, black artists that are um, featured throughout those developments. Um, so that's like, but it's a lot of, um, I, there's a question that I did ask Jasmine Scott about 
to, you know, just to illuminate on what she thought was happening with black ownership of homes, home ownership is different from yes. black entrepreneurial yes. support, right? Yes. So there's a lot of commercial spaces that we're seeing a lot of development in, but where black home ownership is concerned in terms of the future of that, that's where this push has to be, we have to put all of our voices in because that's the part that is the most tenuous right now. Well, it's all tenuous, but yeah, for everyone in the city. And yeah. Affordability and, and access to create uh, generational wealth, yes. you know, for your families. So how, what does that look like? And, you know, how and can you do that? There's this thing, I, I feel like just really compelled to share this um, all with you. This is not um, Seattle rooted, but it is, um, it's a book that I've read that Cynthia and I've talked about. It's called How to Kill a City by Peter Moskowitz. I don't know if you have all heard of it. I strongly recommend getting this book. It will blow your mind in terms of, it's fastidiously researched, but it's also very human. It's looking at how gentrification happened in um, in New York, in Detroit, San Francisco, New Orleans, especially after Katrina. Um, and it, it's, it's a model for the patterning that we're seeing here in Seattle and, the, and the, the speed at which it's happening in Seattle, but in cities all across the country. And one of the things that, um, that he talks about is the, the geography of, of the economy of this, right? That what we're seeing in the communities that why, you know, getting on board with this house bill, not to you know stop it as important is the accessibility not just to each other and culture and communities but also to services gets is is really dangerous for so many people who are ending up unhoused because they can no longer live in city limits and they're being pushed out to the suburbs that supposedly was originally built for middle class folks right so this is where a lot of um, people of color a lot of immigrants of people who are in lower income are getting pushed further and further out where there were no services to begin with because that's not how the suburbs was built, right? So then all of these functions and these cultural spaces that we're trying to save, the people who we're making it for have trouble getting into the city to come to the events or come to the services. So this is the ripple effect of gentrification. It is a crazy dynamic. Dynamic. And so, it, the more we understand it, though, you know, to use a political term, how the sausage is made, like the more we understand it, the the better we can find that nuanced area that we're going to plug ourselves into and harangue and harass and make quantity matter to, to you know to get these people to give us the legislation and policy changes we want. And I would say that the history need not repeat itself. You don't have to. To do that, uh, I see history as rhyming. Yes. As I said, that it, it more or less rhymes. You build on it, you increase it, you learn, you move with it. it you know, it flows. It, it, it's not something that we necessarily um, look at as, uh, you know, repeating itself. At least I don't in my head. So, um, I guess, Rachel? Uh, we've got one more question. No, okay, one more over here. Actually, I, I have a comment. Um, my name is Maisha Barnett, and since you brought up uh, Black <laughs> ownership, I wanted to plug House Bill 1474, which is the Covenant Home Ownership Act. It's on the floor currently, and similar to 1026, you can also advocate for it. Signing pro for House Bill 1474. Uh, and essentially, what it is doing is addressing the historical injustices that were caused by redlining and racial covenants, uh, and it is raising the recording fee so that there is an additional $150 million a year to then redirect into programs like down payment assistance um, and uh, to increase black home ownership. There is one more question. Can you raise your hand? Oh. Hi, hi. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Good to see some familiar faces. Um, my name is Sharpay Beaver. Just coming back here and situated with my camera. I think this is awesome. Love this conversation. Um, Sixth generation Seattle Light, born and raised in the Central District. 
Love the Center District, also have family who grew up in South Seattle, specifically Rainier Beach. And I think discussing how Rainier Beach is considering the role of their social fabric organizations and black led social fabric organizations like in the Central District we had, or we have uh, CAYA, right? Um, POCAN, et cetera. Kind of considering how we'll untitle, uh, incorporate the voices of social fabric organizations. And I bring up Rainier Beach specifically because they have, uh, in the next five years, 12 housing developments will take place. It's going to look completely different, but those who are stewarding these housing plans look like me, right? So that's a story tip I'll just leave out there, but <laughs> I think it's important to think about who is stewarding the plans for future generations in the Central District and reimagining that. So kind of circling back to my question, has Untitled considered that? What might that look like? and bringing in, sifting in the voices of social fabric organizations and leaders? So right now, um, the partners in Untitled are um, uh, Wana Wari and Art, Art Noir. Well, Jasmine Scott, right? Um, and through them, we're, we have a shared meal um, um, project that is part of this, not a public offering, but a shared meal offering inviting people to the table who are developers and policy makers and, and, and community organizers to sit together and have these conversations. And that's the part that sort of throws the line um, of futurity to the project that, that is the afterlife after the offerings and performances. Um, and it's the reason why, um, why I wanted these kinds of partnerships for the project to exist so that it could transcend just the artwork and become like a community activism that is built on those relationships and those discussions so that we know who the players are and who the allies are, whether if they're of the same skin tone or not, right? Because that's always a complicated, that's, that's complicated. Um, and it's recognizing that complication. So, so short answer, yes, um, yes that has been completely considered in, in, in the framework of the project. Well, unfortunately, we are now out of time, um, but thank you so much to our amazing guests. Yes, we have the Stephanie, I know that I'm going to be thinking over so much everything that you shared, and um, you as the audience, thank you for your amazing questions. Um, I hope you take to heart some of the next step, step actions that both our speakers and our audience members have shared to continue thinking about this um, and taking the lessons beyond our um, program here today. Um, and also, quick Ask from Mohai is if you enjoyed the program or have comments that you didn't like about the program, we would love your thoughts. We have a survey, it is in the back. Um, we'll also email it to you. So help us continue to make our offerings much better. Um, also make sure to uh, visit the justice table in the back too on your way out. And if you haven't already seen the From the Ground Up Black Architects and Designers exhibit up on our second floor, Really recommend taking a little time to go up there. Um, and Stephanie already shared so much great information about that at the beginning. So with that, enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Thank you so much. Hope to see you here again soon. Check the website again for Stephanie uh, mentioned the program we're doing on February 28th, Three Generations of Black Architects. So the learning continues. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you.